Hello. Welcome to the Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars' first Shared Experiences Forum, Active Learning in the Classroom. The Shared Experiences Forum brings together some of UTSA's best teachers to talk about their experiences in the classroom. This is the first of our Shared Experiences Forums this semester, uh, so be on the lookout for others upcoming. Before we begin today, I want to thank a number of uh, members of the Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars for organizing this event. Tom Cannon, Colleen Guy, and ha Hazem Rashad Ali. I also want to thank Sune Palsole, Ernest Hernandez, and Chris Cortez for their OIT support, and other members of the OIT team who are here today. Uh, I also want to thank Denise Villarreal and Sherry Bratton from the library for their logistical and advertising support. Our four panelists today are all members of the Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars. The ADTS, Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars, is a group of award-winning faculty at UTSA who provide guidance to the provost about how UTSA can improve teaching excellence. It was established in 2012. I'm Daniel Angster. I'm the current chair of the ADTS, and I'm also the chair of the Department of Political Science and Geography. Uh, also speaking today will be Diane Abdo from the writing program, Catherine Brown from the Department of Anthropology, and Randy Mantefoil from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Our plan is that we'll each talk about five to seven minutes about active learning and how to engage students. Uh, so our, um, our presentations uh, in total should go to about 12.30. And then we'll invite uh, questions both from the audience with us here today as well as you watching online. Uh, and we'll, have a, uh, we'll try to answer your questions and have an open discussion. So we will start with uh, Diane Abdo. I feel like I have uh, perhaps the easiest job because my classes are small. Uh, our classes in the writing program, uh, we like to keep it about 25. I also teach classes for the English department. But uh, I think students are, are more engaged if they are invested in the class. And when I say invested, I mean that they're invested in each other and in the course content and also in the outcome of the class. So. What I try to do to engage students is to find ways that they can be invested in all these areas. For example, at the beginning of the semester, uh, I think you know, one way to get them invested is to create some assignments that allow them to get to know each other. But I think it's important for the assignment to also be connected to the course content. So for example, in my editing class, I have the students write a meet a roadrunner profile of each other. So I show them the one uh, that's on UTSA Today. They see that it's a short profile. And then they interview each other, and they write the Meet the Roadrunner. And they also incorporate a photograph, which gives them a little experience in layout and design as well, which we talk about in editing class. I take those profiles, and I keep them. And then at the end of the semester, I return them to the student writers for editing. So the idea is that they write them at the beginning, and then they can apply their editing skills toward the end of the semester. And I hope that they'll be able to see real application of the theory that we discussed. Uh, secondly, I use those assignments also to uh, pull or to draw information about the students that I can use to engage them in our class discussion. So for example, if I find out a student works in a restaurant or maybe uh, in a law office, because I teach a course called Writing, writing Strategies for Pre-Law, that's in the writing program. I try to ask them to uh, incorporate some of their experiences at, when we give examples in class. And then I try to also use some of those bits of information I've learned about them from the profile. So I think to make them invested in the class, um, I think I can make them invested in the class if I also talk about them. Uh, in addition to that, when we're, we're talking about editing and they've read a chapter and they tried some exercises, when I come into class, this is something I learned actually from attending a seminar here at UTSA, instead of asking the students, do you have any questions, which they probably say yes or no, I ask them, what questions do you have? So that they know that asking a question is really what's expected of them. And they're invited to ask those questions. Also, uh, I like to incorporate, a dis I like to allow the students to make some decisions about the class scheduling. I have a syllabus, of course, but I put on there that the syllabus is tentative, that the deadlines are flexible. And so when we finish some material, let's say an editing class, I ask them, are you ready? Do you think you're ready for the quiz? 
And if they say no, I say, okay, what can we do to get you ready? And if they say, well, we need to still go over parallel structure or modifiers, whatever it is, then we choose an exercise, we go over it again. But I allow them to help set the pace for the quizzes, for the paper deadlines, and they feel again like they're invested not only in the material but in the outcome. In addition to that, they also do peer editing of papers, which is pretty common in our composition classes. But in the advanced professional writing class, we take on a client and we have them write for that client. And I, I brought an example. For example, we did a brochure, the students did a brochure for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. So they actually had a client come in, tell them what they needed for this brochure, and then the students worked in teams. They brought their drafts to class, put them on the document camera, and then all the students were allowed to comment on those drafts. So again, this was a community effort. Then the student teams presented their brochures to the NAMI representative, and one was chosen. Again, they were all invested in that assignment. And uh, so I think incorporating a service learning project in a class is another way to get the students engaged and to get them invested in, their, uh, in the curriculum. And I think it's all about application, real world examples, and student participation. And one last point, when the students, some, sometimes I'll have the students create assignments, and when they go up and present those assignments, I go and sit in the class with them. So I'm part of the class. Not in front of the class, but a member of the class. And we all discuss the assignment. So those strategies have seemed to work, but again, these are for small classes. Um. Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about strategies or active learning strategies for classes that are a little bit larger. Um, I'm in the Department of Anthropology and I'm an archaeologist and so archaeology, the discipline itself, sort of lends itself to hands-on activities and uh, is really team-based in nature and so I try to recreate that in the classroom situation which can be challenging when you have 50 to 80 students enrolled in the class and sometimes in certain situations up to 160 students. And so you have to find creative ways to sort of engage the students uh, and have them uh, work with each other in teams in certain situations. And, one, and, and like Diane, one of the things that um, I try in the course material early on. So within the first three class period meetings, I give a active exercise, which is team-based, essentially a group-based exercise, where I have the students come in, break into teams of three uh, or four. I feel like anything a little bit over that, sometimes uh, you can have students sort of become anonymous in that type of situation. So three groups of three and four, I find, seems to work really well. And within the first three class periods, they get to, they, they end up getting to know somebody in the classroom. They feel comfortable coming to class. They know another name, another face, or at least a couple people. Uh, and then they become a little bit invested. And, and from that, oftentimes, they create study groups, and uh, they can share notes, and help each other out. And so it's really, I think, very important, especially for introduction, in, in, you know, uh, like intro to archaeology classes where you have freshmen and sophomores. They, they feel comfortable coming to class. And with that first initial exercise, when I break them into a group, I always try to connect it to something that they already know something that they're familiar with that they feel comfortable doing and are confident and when you're looking at you know archaeology and new concepts and new definitions they they don't understand uh, um, the materials that we're talking about the different types of artifacts and how we analyze them and how what we do so I create an exercise that deals with um, uh, modern uh, artifacts essentially and I take the uh, what I do is take different households across the nation and include one like a dorm room a, you know college dorm room and I take a list of different types of garbage items for one week and then this have the students analyze that and so they it really resonates with them when they're looking at a list of uh, garbage items from different households and then they have to interpret what that is and then relate it back to 
the course content. And they all, they all get it when it's pizza boxes, rolled up pieces of term papers and paper clips and, and Coca-Cola cans and, and coupons from Subway. Uh, and they, they can then reconstruct the type of activities that were occurring there. And then basically I go from there to, this is what archeologists do in the past with these types of activities. We look at the garbage in the past and try to interpret what the household is is about and so they go from what they know uh, from the known essentially to the unknown and it makes them much more comfortable initially and they get really excited about it uh, uh, as well and I think that's really important and so I do one of those we also do uh, another group activity throughout the semester where we break down and actually analyze real artifacts real ancient artifacts and and they get to hold them, touch them. It's much better than seeing pictures of them. They, they, they get it um, and are more passionate about uh, their work. And then I include uh, one or two individual active exercises where they work not as a team, but as an individual in the class, do the exercise and then report back to the classroom and then usually those type of uh, activities that they do, uh, like a worksheet or whatever, I use that same type of material on the exam. So when they get the exam, they feel real comfortable because they've already essentially done that once in the classroom. And I think it sort of reinforces what they're learning. And it does help them feel more confident when they go into the exam. Um, as far as active learning exercises, I think that they can even be extended to graduate level classes and to seminars. I mean, we do lots of discuss discussion in seminar classes, but you can break your grad seminars into groups as well and teams and then have them do exercises and report back. And I think it provides a, a, a little bit of a different learning atmosphere for graduate students as well. And so these are some of the strategies that I've used in my classes. Well, very good. Well, I'm uh, Randy Monteufel, and I'm in engineering, so it's a little bit different than what we've already discussed. But I'd like to start my uh, time and talk a little bit about active learning from my perspective. You know, I have taught uh, like I was taught and, uh, and have slowly evolved over a number of years to become more what I call active. And uh, so what I want to do is uh, talk about my definition of active learning in an engineering context, an engineering class, as well as give three takeaways. Uh, if you're uh, listening in, you probably want to grab something and maybe try to adopt it in your class. And that's the way I've slowly evolved is grab things out of uh, presentations from other uh, excellent teachers. So to start the discussion, first just ask, what is learning? Forget the word active in front of it. And uh, ask the question, how do students learn? And where do students learn? And how much learning occurs in my classroom currently? And uh, the answer to those questions may be obvious when we reflect on them, but sometimes uh, we overlook the obvious. And, uh, how do students learn? I think students learn when they engage with the material, when they try to do something. Uh, not see somebody else do it, but they actually do it. Um, when they uh, try to solve a problem on their own, when they try to do a comparison or a contrast, or write a paper or create a design, those are activities that they do. Where do students learn? Um, lots of learning is done in the quiet of a room, a quiet library, a quiet bedroom, a quiet study room, uh, free from distractions, free from the television, free from the internet, free from other noises that may distract them. Uh, they also occur in small groups, but I think a lot of learning still occurs in the quiet of a room where somebody is able to deeply reflect on what they're trying to do and uh, focus on the task at hand. And then how much learning actually occurs in my classrooms? Uh, if a student is spending 50 minutes of their life in my classroom, and what are they getting from it? What are, what are they learning? If they're sleeping or nodding off or checking social media or texting, playing games, every one of these has happened in my classroom, and I'm sure it's happened in a lot of classrooms. Um, that's off-task activities, and they're not learning. That's not learning. They're waiting for something to awake them, 
so they can get on task and, and come back into engagement of the class. So what promotes learning in the classroom? The answer is activities that get the students to do real things that are meaningful, to recall some information. Uh, think of Bloom's taxonomy, just recall the basics all the way up to putting uh, answers to complicated questions, making detailed calculations, coming in with the comparison contrast, creating something, designing something, solving a problem. So with that, now I'd like to talk about three things that I personally do to promote active learning in, again in my classes, which have gradually grown in size, and now I'm looking at 80 to 100, 125 students in an engineering class. So uh, that's my perspective. But I only want to cover three things. I know I have a longer list. I tried to pare it down. It was difficult to cover three. And then also, I didn't want to put anything that I'm not doing in my classroom. I didn't want to talk about anything that I may try, that it sounded good, but that I currently am doing with the hope that if you're attending and listening, maybe there's some benefit to you. So here are my top three things to promote active learning in my classes. Ask questions and get answers from as many students that will give you the answer, that will participate with you. Uh, when the class size was around 20, I was able to ask questions, look them in the eye, and get a lot of answers. But then as the class size grew, uh, I saw that a lot of students were disengaging when I asked the question. Uh, they weren't actively struggling with the, to try to get the answer. And I would then ask them, you know, why aren't you working on this? And they would say something like, well, that question's too hard. And every time I asked the question, I found out that I'm wrong. And uh, you know the answer to the question. Eventually, you're going to answer your own question. So I'm taking a little nap now. And, and I'm going to come back awake in a second or two when you decide to answer your own question. So about Two years ago, I looked for technology to how to, I can get students to actively answer that question, and I moved to clickers. And so it's the technology that I hate, but I use because the students don't hate it. I hate to say that. <laughs> to give you some comments, these are from surveys that I conducted at the end of the semester, and the students said on a survey, I think it's greatly, I think it, the, the clickers, greatly improved my attentiveness in class. Another student, I don't like to use clickers, but it helps me to focus more. And another student, they wake me up in the middle of the lecture. And another student, it keeps you on your toes and lets you know where you need to improve in the material. So that's my first suggestion, to ask questions and to get as many students as possible to engage in answering that question. The second suggestion is leave the front of the room. Pose a problem. Give them time to work on it and walk around the room. Be friendly. Uh, I look at the student's work over their shoulder. I'll give them hints, lots of hints. Think about this. Uh, uh, get excited when somebody has the correct answer. I get a little animated. Uh, I'll say, wow, this is great. I avoid saying you're wrong. I say, keep working on it. Keep working, yeah, keep working on it. And uh, maybe the class, uh, I'll count and I'll say, I want five correct answers from five different students, or 10 correct answers from 10, and I'll even count down. Got four, I'm looking for one more. You know, anybody, anybody, raise your hand, I'll go over there and take a look. So get away from the front of the room um, and give them time to work on the problem. The last point is uh, prepare students for learning outside of the classroom. This is a difficult one for me to really make sense of it. But I recently surveyed students and I said, You've You've been ex exposed to really great teachers. You've been exposed to really terrible teachers. From your perspective, what are the things that really make a terrible teacher? And what are the things that make a great teacher? And, oh, they loved that survey. They filled it out. and I had a lot of material to work with. Uh, here are the top five things for a terrible teacher. Teacher was difficult to understand, couldn't be heard. Teacher didn't work enough example problems, theory, theory, three, but no applications. Teacher wasn't prepared for class. Teacher was boring, and teacher clicked through PowerPoints. What about a great teacher? T top five, enjoys teaching. It's obvious to the student that you enjoy teaching. You want to be there. They can't exude, exude, uh, exude more confidence or enthusiasm than you do. The teacher's prepared for class. The teacher works enough example problems, helps them solve problems, apply the theory. 
makes the things exciting, and really knows the materials. So two of these touch on helping students be prepared for learning outside of the classroom when the 50 minutes is over. And they touch on work enough example problems, and then that enthusiasm that we carry, it carries out outside the classroom. So you may disagree with me on this, but regardless of what we do in the most active classroom, deep learning often occurs when the student is able to concentrate individually on the material and focus on the subject without distractions that sometimes are in the classroom. So my top three things for promoting active learning are ask questions, get out of the front of the room, and exude confidence. Be happy. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm at the disadvantage of uh, being the last to present, and so um, everyone's already stolen all my thunder. Uh, but I'll, I'll try and uh, take a, a, a sort of a different perspective on this. Uh, I want to start by just asking the question of, of um, uh, why is active learning important? Uh, and here I'm going to appeal to uh, some educational research that I've read, which uh, repeatedly shows that students who engage in materials learn more and retain more than those who passively receive it. Um, Interestingly, too, uh, research shows that um, active learning is especially important for first-generation college students, women, uh, Latinos, and black students. Um, that these students all benefit greatly from active learning. Um, uh, there's a, some of you may have seen there's an article in the New York Times last September uh, it, by the title, Are College Lectures Unfair?, uh, which talked about that, that uh, showing that, that uh, uh, drawing on some research that shows that active learning benefits all students, but those who benefit most are the first generation women, uh, black and Latino students. Uh, so obviously, right, this should, should catch our attention being a, a faculty here at UTSA, uh, since this is largely our, our student body. Now, uh, why? Why especially uh, would it seem that uh, first generation women, black and Latino students uh, benefit more from active learning? One explanation, or at least hypothesis, um, is that uh, students who, uh, that these students are less well prepared when, when they come to college. A student who's less well prepared, who goes into a lecture, won't be able to process that information, won't be able to draw as, as many inferences from that information. Uh, they just won't, you know, the lecture literally will be going over their heads uh, in large part. Students who are better prepared come and they can, they can hear a lecture and they can draw out all kinds of, uh, um, you know, conclusions from that. Now, active learning can step in here because especially insofar as you design active learning assignments, uh, which focus on basic concepts. It asks students to learn these basic concepts and learn them in their own way, uh, and to a certain extent at their own, their own pace. Uh, if they're in groups or if they're in individually, they're having to think through this, uh, and that can be very important in, in uh, closing the gap between better and, more, and lesser uh, prepared students uh, entering into a college class. A second explanation for why active learning might be especially important for first generation uh, students, women, uh, blacks and Latinos, is that these groups may feel uh, less comfortable uh, entering into a, a, a college camp. I, I uh, am a first generation college student and uh, when I, my, my first year at college was, uh, you know, fuddling to me. I, I didn't know, everyone sort of seemed to, to know what was going on and, and uh, I didn't. Um, but what active learning does is um, by engaging students, it can make them feel more, more comfortable in the classroom. Uh, whether it's individually or in groups, they start to feel like they're, they understand what's going on here, they have a part to play, uh, they're more comfortable um, uh, in the classroom, and uh, that, com that, that comfort level can breed confidence, and then they can, uh, you know, uh, they feel more confident to under undertake self-motivated learning. Uh, something that Kat mentioned also, uh, I think is very important, that if you do active learning through group projects, then students get to know other students in the classroom. They form a peer group, uh, and that can make them feel more comfortable. I've also found, you know, as much as I like to believe that students come to class to hear me, you know, my, 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 the substance of my material, the truth is that students are coming to, into class in part because they have a friend in the class, uh, because they have a crush on someone else in the class. Like, you know, use that, right? Use the, the other students in the class because, because students are coming to class in part for the other students who are in the class. So, so active learning uh, you know, draws on that and, and makes that a tool that we can use to bring students to class and, and to help them learn. Uh, so uh, next question, what is active learning? Here I want to bring the bar way down uh, because um, uh, this is something that a uh, process I've gone through. When I first started thinking about using active learning in my, in my classes, I went to some seminars and People told me about these kind of elaborate procedures they use where you know, at the beginning of class they put students in groups of six and the students take a 12 question quiz and then you know, a representative from the group comes up to the front of the classroom and 
the professor grades the quiz, and if they miss any, they go back, and the, gr the group has to discuss the questions, and then they have to get together with another group, and you know, all this, I mean, it's not a wonderful to me, but I said, I, 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 don't, I don't really want to teach that way. I, I, I'm not really willing to go, go to, to those lengths, I guess, uh, with my active, my active uh, uh, teaching. Um, so if you're willing to, you know, pursue that, but, but I wasn't. Uh, and the good news is to get some big bang for your buck, you don't have to go that far. There are some just really simple things you can do. So, um, you know, active learning, uh, the, 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 the simple definition and the definition which, which I research shows actually works is, is uh, active learning is anything you do to get students to actively engage in, in learning. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really that simple. And, um, you know, the research shows simple things like, uh, you know, a low stakes quiz at the beginning of every class um, can, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's research, this is actually a UT Austin professor did this, these low stake quizzes um, and uh, increased uh, success rates in his class, um, flows the, the, the um, success rate between the, the, I think this was more affluent, less affluent students by 50%. Um, I got all kinds of benefits. Um, so, so it's really, and uh, you know, the other things, just having students do an online assignment about the reading before they come to class, you, know, you, you, you assign reading and you, you give two questions that they have to answer. Uh, that could be active learning. Um, so I'm going to tell you about four things I use in the classroom. They're all really easy. I've used them in classes of, of 30 and 40. I've used them in a class of 200. Um, they're, they're, they're easily adaptable. So one thing I do is uh, I, I give students extra credit if they do a, a half page to a one page summary of the reading and they turn it in at the beginning of class. I talk to students about why this is important. I say, I say, look, if you sit down and do the reading tonight, uh, you know, you just kind of whiz through the reading, and then you get up and walk away, and then tomorrow you come into class, and I ask you a question about the reading, chances are you won't remember, right? You'll say, oh, geez, I, you know, hmm, I, I can't remember. You know, I did my chemistry reading last night. I did my science reading. It's all kind of, you know, somehow merging together. Uh, if you just take five minutes after you read to actually summarize in your own terms what you've read, uh, and do that by writing just even three or four sentences. Um, the main idea of this reading was this. I found this really interesting. I didn't understand this. Uh, you'll, you'll retain that information. You'll walk into class tomorrow, and, and you'll know what you read, and you'll be able to talk about it. Uh, so I do that. Uh, second thing I do, is, as I mentioned, I give uh, a quiz every second or third class, just a very un you know, a central concept. Uh, this uh, helps students. Uh, you know, it encourages them to read. Uh, it also helps to focus their attention because through these quizzes they begin to learn, you know, what does this professor at least think a central concept in this reading is, right? I read, I read these, you know, 15 or 20 pages. Uh, he's going to ask me a central concept. Hmm, I better think about before I go into class, like, what does he think the central concept is? And you train the students to think, right, uh, in, in that way. Um, thirdly, I have the, I'll stop in the middle of class sometimes and ask a question. Um, uh, you know, just something of, uh, you, know, um, you know, okay, now everyone stop for, you know, uh, two minutes and, and you define Marx's concept of alienation in your own terms. Um, if they write it down, uh, that helps them learn that, that information. Uh, I have them then write their names, they turn that in, they like that, they feel like they're getting credit for coming to class and doing an activity. Um, and also this helps to draw shy students into the conversation because if I can call on students then, I can say, you know, Alex, what's your, you know, what's your definition? And, you know, Alex can say, you know, well, I don't know if this is right, but my sheet says, you know, suddenly it's not them, it's their sheet who's speaking. Uh, and, uh, and then finally I do some of these group activities, um, you know, that, that others have talked about. Uh, so I think my time is up. So, so those are just very, you know, four very easy things you can do to, uh, encourage active learning that can be adapted to any classroom, and um, you can actually get, I think, some decent results from those. So, um, we will now open the floor to questions and discussion. Uh, if, you're, if you're watching us online, I guess there's some mechanism. Well, can we hang the microphone around so you can see people watching online? Go ahead and ask the question. Okay, so we have, uh, we have online, you can ask questions, and then we also have uh, people here in person who. Uh, so this is a question for Randy. Uh, so I'm in engineering too, and so I think Randy could probably help me uh, figure the answer to this one. My difficult part in my classes is that I figured out that there are five or six students who always answer the question, and the other students are like, they just don't try because there are these students who will always answer the question. So how do you deal with, how do you get the average or below average student to uh, do active learning? 
Well, before I moved to the technology, which every student is supposed to bring one of those clickers to class, and again, I don't like the technology. I'd like to get away from it. Every semester I ask, should I continue it? And they're overwhelmingly say, continue it, so I'm kind of stuck until another technology comes along. But uh, before I did that, I would say, okay, only those sitting here, only those sitting here. And another professor would always say, okay, you're on the shelf. I don't do that, but another professor shared that with me. You're on the shelf. You answered last time. You know, we know you know the answer. I, I want to now find out. So put students on the shelf, sort of like they're, they're prized. They, they, they're recognized for being correct already, and so, but they're ineligible for participation. Or go with subsets. And I used to joke. I'd say, okay, here comes my long, bony finger. I'm going to point down to your nose and pick you to answer it. But I'd, it usually puts the heart rate too high in a student. It's, it's not good. But I used to do that. If I, if I could say something here, I mean, here, here is also where if you ask the students, uh, you know, you ask the question and then you give them a minute to write that down. Uh, I feel much comfortable uh, or much more comfortable asking them, you know, to call them out then if, if I say, you know, if I can say, you know, Alex, what did you write down as opposed to, you know, Alex, what's, it, what's the question, right? Because it's, it seems much less aggressive, right? It's not me asking you on the spot. I've given you a minute. You wrote your answer. And then I say, just what, you know, what'd you write? Okay, well, you know, all right, that's a decent answer. Who else? What else did you write? And, and you know, this is a way that, again, you, you, the, the student sort of feels like the, the answer is mediated through her or his paper, uh, and maybe they, they'll feel more comfortable. And, of course, once a student speaks in class, they're going to be much more likely to Hi, this is for Dan. That uh, technique of getting the students to write down a summary or their reaction to a reading, do you think that could be applied at lower level classes for like chapters in, in textbooks like physical geography or basic geography or something like oh, that? So yeah, yeah. Just, do, you ha do you have any specific advice on it? I mean, to react or summarize the entire chapter seems kind of like a lot, and yet I wouldn't want them to just outline the chapter. So, you know, that, that's kind of what I'm asking is, is there's a specific way to go about that. Right, for, for the, the summaries, like the before class summaries? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah um, I mean, you know, one thing you could, uh, I, I would think, you know, something that might be a useful exercise is uh, rather than, say, summarize this chapter, uh, you know, maybe say something like, you know, summarize what you think are the three most important uh, things or what are the three most important concepts uh, and then actually begin the class by you saying, you know, here, you know, you read the chapter, here's, you know, I read the chapter. I'm going to tell you what I, as a professor, I think these are the three most important concepts. And then I'm going to ask you if you had any other ones and why you included those, and we can have a conversation about this. But, but by doing that, you get them to focus in, right, on, on their reading, and then, okay, now I have to read in a way that I focus in on the main concepts and, and can summarize them. Uh, and then they get to, you, they see you model it for them. So that, you know, if they're constantly getting the wrong three concepts, then they start to, you know, they start to internalize you, you know, your, your way of reading uh, over the course of the semester. Yeah. I have a bit of a more general question which pertains more to those group works, but I guess also to those short activities. Um, every time I've played with active learning, I felt there's a bit of a loss of control over the content on my end, of course, right? I give it to the students. So you sit down in 10 minutes and you define this concept, and then I'll have those group presentations. And whatever comes out of those group presentations is what some of the others in class will take away. Um, and of course, I share this uh, Professor Manteuffel saying, you don't point fingers and you don't say this is blatantly wrong, you got it all wrong. But how, how much encouragement can you give if over time there are missing crucial points and how much of the content do you take back and then present after they've done their presentations? That's my solution right now. I let them do their presentations, I give a bit of a summary afterwards. But some of my students feel stupid because of, again, they know this is coming anyway, so why should I even try in the group? So how, how do I manage this loss of control over content? Uh, and I feel there's always a balance between activating and losing this control. Well, I, I, think, I think what you're doing is really, you know, probably a really good strategy of having them present a summary and then doing a summary afterwards that will present your view, but maybe not, um, you know, frame it as this is the correct way or whatever. But um, I would also, um, at, at least with mine, when I have them, uh, a lot of times when they do the group exercise and they report back, um, they're, they really aren't getting the big concept. And so then I, I try to um, 
you know, emphasize that in, a, in as positive and enthusiastic way as possible and just say, well, you're very close. Uh, you, you're, you're almost there, you know, and I think that maybe if you had a little bit more information or a little bit further in the semester, you would have gotten, you would have gotten this correct, but this is what, you know, what I want you to get and then kind of frame it that way. And so give that, you know, uh, the, the Randy enthusiasm uh, about the, the good, you know, try there, but then, you know, kind of drive home the message at the end. And so, and, and then, I also uh, re-emphasize this. I give a review sheet before I give any type of uh, a summative exercise, you know, like an exam or something. And then on that, I'll have those major concepts or whatever that they need in the review sheet and then kind of go over that with them. And so that'll reinforce it right before if you're going to be doing an exam. So if it's a group activity, they didn't get it exactly right, then go over it again and then review it again before you give an exam. In the writing classes, we don't really give exams. Everything is the application. But when students uh, present some ideas, then what I try to do is, of course, as I say, sit among them and then try to find one area that seems to be strong and then ask the class, where can we go with this? and then see if the class can actually, as a group, direct us to the area where I want them to go. And I think what that does is, it, again, it gives them, it empowers them somewhat to take the discussion and then where I think it needs to go. And then I keep asking those questions. Okay, so if we go there with it, then what can we do with it? And then what can we do with it? So um, I'd like the students to try to, to uh, again, take that point where it needs to go by asking them to participate. But then I, in turn, will guide them in that. Mm -hmm. If I could add also one comment. It sounds like maybe you want to pull back a little bit, dice it up into smaller segments. And uh, I've always been amazed how many students are lost. And I'll even cover some point, and then I'll say, do, we, do you got this point? I'll mm -hmm. say it, and I'll say it. And it, it's like, he's going to ask a question. Click. I, I don't use PowerPoint, but I, I have a journal and it's electronic screen, and so it's wiped away and there's a question to apply it, and then they have 30 or 60 seconds. So I try to break it into smaller segments, and you'll be amazed how many are just flat wrong. Don't be so trivial, but it's hard for me to get 100% correctness in the class. Maybe there are some students that are just joking with me. Oh, he thinks it's A. Here goes C. Because it's too low a stakes, you know, mm -hmm. for me, because they complain if it's too high stakes. You're asking tough questions, blah, blah, blah. Challenging too hard, but break it into segments and then give more instantaneous feedback on the smaller parts and don't turn it over for 10 to 15 minutes to a project, because I know what you're talking about. You turn it over and now, now the class is over 50 minutes up and some people got the impression what group A presented was right and it's not. I would like to share something that I do, and I don't even know if it's right or not. When I'm asking questions, I teach Spanish. When I ask questions, you know, and if somebody gets stuck, I always said either a mayday for somebody to answer or an SOS. And uh, somebody comes with the answer, you know, and the other one repeats, and that's how I do it. And I don't know if that's crazy, but it seems to work, and they get a laugh out of it. So if they are, awake, if they are asleep, they wake, you know, so... That's what I do, and I just wanted to know if you think that's crazy or it's okay. Whatever works, it's okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, Thank you. Well, uh, you've touched on it already about building friendships in class, and this is a fourth point, but I failed to do that as an instructor, and I'm going to take some, com uh, some suggestions to try and improve that, because if they're going to class just to listen to me, that's not right. They're going to class for other re reasons. And so one of the things I'll do when I'm walking around is I'll say, you have a friend sitting just two seats away from you. You should get to know them. They have the right answer. I won't tell them the right answer, but then they'll be like, hey, what do you have? Mm -hmm. So maybe that was on her point of trying to promote student-to-student -student interaction mm -hmm. and not be the only source of the right answer, but point them to other students that have the right answer. And I think laughter is very important. Yeah. I mean, I think if we can, if we look like we're having fun, you know, as Randy's saying, the students are going to enjoy it too. 
Um, I have, uh, in one class I taught, I, I would have the students, of course, peer edit papers, and then I mixed them up and said, next time you cannot edit the paper you edited before. And so I sent one set, one set of students on one side of the room to the other side of the room and did the same thing for the other side. And this one student stood up and, and he said, I should have been sitting next to this dude all semester. <laughs> and it was funny because he finally he got, he got next to a student who was very good at editing. And so I, I think that the, if the class atmosphere is relaxed, the students will be relaxed, they're more engaged. I also have them in editing class bring in outside editing uh, bloopers. And so they go up in front of the class and they show the mistake, but they don't tell the class what the mistake is and the class has to identify it. And they get an extra point for doing that. And the other day we actually created examples together and they had very definite opinions about the presidential candidates and we punctuated that sentence and at the end of the class about five students stood up and said can we take a picture of our sentence and they took pictures of the sentences they created on the blackboard that was and it was just done on a whiteboard I mean it was active learning they came up with the example they were invested in it it was their example it made sense Hey, thanks. This has been really helpful. Um, so I've found that it's easier to do these active learning things when I've got like an hour and 15 minutes or when I've got a seminar. But when I've got a 50-minute class, I feel, I feel like if I do one thing, all of a sudden I'm behind and I can't bring the class. I can't, I can't keep the class on schedule. Um, you know, even just taking five to ten minutes to do an exercise is like a big chunk of a 50-minute class. So I just wonder how you guys manage that tension. Let me just start by saying <laughs> I agree, uh, and I was just part of this group looking into getting trying to get rid of the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, and and there are lots of reasons not to. So, uh, so we're uh, you know so we so we, we we have to stick with the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and so when I you know I haven't I haven't taught Monday, Wednesday, Friday in a little while because I, I've been avoiding it, but my turn is coming up again. Um, and I think there you know this is just one of these things that that. Uh, People talk about with active learning, and you just have to um, you have to slow down. You know, you have to cut back your content a little bit, right? You have to you have to think about, you know, when when you're going to do this, you have to go to the end of your class and think about, you know, look, uh, you know, what do I really want students to walk out of this class knowing? Because, you know, six months from now, I mean, you know, right? It's it's you know they they remember so little, and two years later, right? I mean, you you know, think back to. You know, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, a class you took, you know, you probably can't even be like, did I even take that class, right? So, so, uh, so once you realize, you know, I mean, those things, then, you know, maybe you can feel, you, you just say, like, look, I've got a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. I'm just going to have to cut back. You know, if I'm going to do this class and, and get the students to really understand or retain this information, I'm just going to have to slow down and I'm just going to have to, you know, cut off a book or not teach those two chapters. And that's a sacrifice, but it's probably a greater sacrifice to, to not do the engage, you know, the engagement activities that will make the class more enjoyable and memorable for them. And that. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have strategies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing to do is start on time, and never ever. This is a don't. Don't go over time. Stop a little early, actually, but start on time. The other is is uh, there was a paper, and I don't know. It's only I saw it a few years ago, but it was titled something like this. It said. Uh, your class doesn't even have enough time to cover everything that is essentially important or really super important. Some title like that. Like, what? You mean, I know that there's extra stuff that I could cover that's kind of neat, but you mean I don't even have enough time to cover the most important, essential parts? And that's your point. You just have to, content has to be winnowed down to what's really important. And I think that's where you get it. Because uh, quite frankly, I'm tired of grading final exams, and uh, they're so off. They're, they're off. I don't know what they were doing, but, or maybe you're grading a, a project and saying, I don't know what class they were sitting in, but they didn't get it. <laughs> so focus on what they need to get, just like Dan said, and emphasize that to death. The other thing is if you have a key concept, instead of teaching it the way you usually teach it, see if you can create an activity that teaches that same concept. So that way you don't have to eliminate it, you just actually communicate it through an activity. 
Sometimes if you, um, I, I've had the same situation with a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, and if you have 60 to 100 students in there and you want to break them into groups, by the time they get situated, it's, it's really challenging. And then you pass out whatever exercise they're going to do. But if you put it on Blackboard ahead of time with an email that says, please review this because we're going to get into a group you know, uh, and have a group discussion and we'll start right away. Um, at least one person in that group usually will have, have read it. Only one, but you will at least be, have one person that will kind of take a leader role and be able to say, okay, we got to organize this way and um, get busy. And then give them a, you know, uh, a, just a limit to how much time they can spend. You've got 10 minutes to do this and then you've got to report back. And so they will, um, it, as long as they you know, have that clock ticking, they'll start producing something as a group because they've got to report it back. And, and so it, it works better in an hour and 15 minute situation, obviously, but I think you can do it and um, be successful, but post the stuff early and then, you know, kind of keep them to that time limit. And then be flat. My thing is, I'm real flexible. I have on my syllabus that this is a tentative schedule. Uh, I am flexible, and I even have the students uh, let me know if they want to include some kind of topic that I don't actually uh, am not covering. And if the class wants to, I, you know, will change things up and go their direction. So I build in a lot of flexibility uh, with the class. Uh, hi. Thank you very much for the very uh, good panel. I don't have a question, I have a comment, and I was wondering if you can give me some feedback. I think one important factor in uh, active learning, which I learned from the very same article that Dr. Inkster mentioned from New York Times, is mutual learning. Like I teach geo, uh, geographic information systems, it's a GIS computer software, so you might be more familiar with it. So in, it's a very kind of updating its updates and it changes every day and there are plenty of digital data online. So a lot of my students know uh, more than I do about the specific data they are looking for, right? So it's very free kind of choose your own project. So I make it uh, sure that they know it's a mutual learning. I'm learning as much as they are learning. So we are learning together. And I do use the same example mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, that if you sit with next to this student, he has the same data, for example, the GIS data for Texas, Bear County, that you will need later on. So I will use that mutual learning a lot. So if you have any comments about that, make it a little bit more, we are in the same level, right? Not standing in front of the classroom. And another thing that goes with uh, what uh, Dr. Inster mentioned is that after I ask them to write summary, the last paragraph of the summaries is uh, dedicated to what they will remember five years from that reading. And they are more comfortable to write about what they kind of, con how they connect those concepts to their everyday life. Not just, okay, we are in gender and cities or feminist geography. This is the concept, oops, sorry. Uh, this is the concept of, uh, I don't know, inter uh, subjectivity or intersectionality, right? So how that applies in your life, five years, what do you remember? from these really thick, rich theoretical uh, papers we just had in five years. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Thank you. I have actually a question. Um, is it okay to give them in the middle? My voice carries, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's oh, the, oh my gosh, I hate these things. <laughs> anyway, um, at the, I have a custom at the middle of the semester, uh, you know, with a mini quiz or something, I attach a little survey. And it's anonymous, and I say, this is your time. Tell me what you like, what you don't like. Sometimes what they don't like, there's nothing I can do about it because it's homework and things like that. But, um, and what they, you would change in my class, you know. And um, they look at me kind of funny and say, well, I want to tailor the class to your needs. That's why I need all this feedback. And it's really interesting. I don't know if it's okay or it's weird or no, what. I right. just, um, no. somebody suggested it ages ago and I picked it up and I find it very, very interesting and I learn from them what they like, what they don't like, you know. So, and one thing, somebody said that you're supposed to be a passionate teacher. 
that's uh, most uh, my students say that's what they like about my class, mm -hmm. that I'm passionate, I'm nuts. That's another thing. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's really, to read those is really neat, but I was wondering if I was on the right track or not. Is it okay? Yeah, All right, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd say, yeah, I think that's a great practice um, because it gives students ownership of the class in the sense that they can actually, you know, that, that, they're, uh, that they're, they're affecting it in the class. I mean, I did have, uh, way back when I was in graduate school, a professor who did that, who also said, though, if you're going to do this, though, you better, you know, you better listen to the students or you better give some kind of feedback to the students, right? Because the worst thing you can do is you pass out a survey like that and then, and then nothing changes, right? You know, uh, uh, you, know um, you, you need to report back and you need to, you need to be willing to change. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, um, uh, you know, too, uh, you know, I, this is going way back, but, but uh, a comment or a question before about, you know, what do you do if, if you, you know, if you have groups report and they're getting the information wrong? Um, well, you know, uh, you know, I think you have to do all the things that people said. You have to try and guide them to the right answer. But you also have to think about the questions that you're asking, right? You have to, um, uh, you know, if, if you're going to ask students to, to answer a question and to give you information, then, then you need to, you know, you need to be ready and open for whatever response is, right? If you, if you really just want them to say, you know, that the answer is X, then, then sort of, you know, why are you asking the question? I mean, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, if you're asking the question, at the very least, you should be saying, you know, look, you know, the definition, Marcus' definition of alienation is this, but I want to hear how you understand it because, you know, maybe you can provide us a richer, de you know. So, so if you're going to ask that question, right, you have to, you sort of have to, in, in part, you're, when you ask a question, you're giving up some of the control of the content you're, by asking the question, and so you have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Go ahead. Anything else? So I have a question about the group work. So we doing group assignments. I've had a number of students come to me later because they're given grades on the group assignments of students complaining that other students aren't participating and they end up doing all the work, or two of them end up doing all the work. How do you, how do you how have you dealt with those kind of situations, especially when everybody's getting graded for the work? I do peer evaluation, so the students get to evaluate the group members. And they, they rate them, I give them a scale, and they rate them on the scale, and then I give them a place for comments. So all the other group members know that their teammates are going to evaluate them, and that I will read those evaluations, and they, the results will have some impact on their grade. I, um, because of the situation that you're explaining, I actually, with my group work uh, in the classroom, I've just gone to just giving them a participation grade as opposed to actually get, giving them a formal grade um, because of that situation. And then what I've, I, I don't, I, what I think happens because of that is that the students are become, because, you know, they aren't so concerned about uh, a grade. They actually are more interested in, in giving their opinion and, and you know, participating in those uh, situations. And so at least that, that is what I think happens. But I just give them a participation grade as a group as opposed to a group grade. And so that's because of the, the concerns that you mentioned. And I've had that same experience. And I just sort of moved away from group grades. So. A um, little honesty here, uh, I used to do more group stuff and because of that I moved away. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was, it's a philosophy thing, it's like I've got other things to worry about and maybe another class is going to cover that in our senior design capstone. They have two semesters back to back with teams so it's kind of covered in the curriculum in other places and I don't have that burden on my class. But. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not confident I'm doing the students justice by not making them work a little bit more with their fellow students and kind of learning by doing that. But it's just too much. It's too much on my course, and I have avoided it. I also allow students to fire a teammate. <laughs> that is a good idea. Yeah, if, a they, good if a teammate is not doing his or her job, I, and I tell them at the beginning in the instructions, you, you may be fired. And uh, what the students can do is come in and see me and say, we would like to fire this teammate because. And then I bring the teammate in. And we have a little mediation there. And what I found is a, a few times, this doesn't happen very often, 
but a few times a teammate that was the offender says, you're right, I didn't do the job. So I think it teaches a lot of lessons, and that's what I like about it. Uh, well, I think, uh, I think that uh, brings us to the end of our first Shared Experiences Forum. Uh, as I said at the beginning, there will be more of these to come uh, later in the semester, so please be on the lookout. You'll be receiving emails. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank uh, everyone who, who organized this, and thank you all for your, your great comments and your great questions from everyone. Uh, this was fun for me, and I hope, I hope it was fun for you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.